Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a Tuesday morning at Chem 1105 with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everybody. Hi. Today's going to be a lab day. We'll do the lab first, actually two labs. And uh, afterward, we'll get back to lecture material, moles, and balanced chemical equations. Good stuff. But first, I like to talk about a couple of things. One, don't forget, hand in labs. Labs, you'll need a selfie. Actually, it'd be like this. I don't know if your eyes go like that. Now, one of the things I did, I noticed over the weekend, I corrected this morning, is a problem with the syllabus. And it was a minor problem, but I corrected it. Just checking to make sure everybody can see what I'm doing now. And the place I made the correction was here on the tentative lab schedule. And what I did is I renumbered it because it's numbered wrong. And two, I moved the balanced chemical equation to today lab, lab number six, where it was paired with lab number seven. Notice I forgot to take off the word and. But anyways, that's the only correction I made. All right, let's talk about today's lab. You'll be handling various chemicals, so you should wear your safety goggles and gloves, and if you want a lab apron, I'd highly recommend for this lab, wear a long sleeve top, or if you have a lab coat. All right, you'll be working with some chemicals. Some of them are hazardous, not kill you immediately, but you don't want it on your skin and you never want it on your eyes. Now, if you do, rinse it first with cold water for about five, six minutes. But if you have gloves on and a long sleeve top, you won't have a problem. Now, the other thing is some of the chemicals may react with a marble top if you have that in your kitchen. So I'd highly recommend either doing the experiments if you have a big sink or You get one of these aluminum foil pans and they're here they've got them in bulk, but let's try this. Nope, the one's in Google, so let's go to a place I don't get a kickback from, but If you go to Walmart, you can buy decent sized pans for about a dollar to three dollars a piece, four dollars. I would highly recommend you buy one of these big ones and do your experiments in there. So if you miss trip or whatever, you won't have any problems if you have a marble top. Now, for today's lab, you should always wash your hands, even with gloves on, before you do the lab. You know how you can tell a chemist, especially organic chemist, in a restroom? 
they wash their hands before and after they do go to the restroom. So today's lab, wash your hands before and afterward. Rinse off your gloves. You can wipe them off on paper towel, let them dry and reuse them. But I'd still wash my hands after the lab. All right. Today's lab is a fun lab. Well, they all are, but this is a lot of fun. And what are you going to be doing? Well, let me get it up for you. Today, you'll be exploring chemical and physical changes. And we talked about that already in terms of the lecture. Well, let's look at the lab. Now, as always, wear proper protective equipment, especially goggles and gloves, and you should wear an apron. Now, how do you know when you have a chemical change? When you mix two things together, if you see a gas form, you see a chemical change. Let's try this. It worked. So if you see the production of a gas, which means if you see any bubbles, you have a chemical change. Now, the other thing, if you mix two things together and say there are liquids or one's a liquid, one's a solid, and you see a precipitate, a precipitate, they say an insoluble solid, you see if, especially if you mix two liquids together, if you see a solid form and it floats, I like special effects, it floats to the bottom of a uh, the test tube, you've got a chemical reaction. If you see production of light, which in this lab, I don't think you will, but if you did, you have a chemical reaction. Now, if you see production or absorption of heat, what does this mean? A change in temperature. If you take the temperature of something, two liquids, they're about the same, you mix them together and it gets really cold, the temperature drops, you have a chemical change. If you mix two things together and the temperature goes up, you have a chemical change. Now, the last one I'd like to talk about is a little tricky. And that's if you see a color change, then that may or may not be a chemical uh, change. Now, what do we mean by may or may not? Now, a chemical change happens when you mix two things together and there's a major color change. If you have two clear liquids, you mix them together and it turns red or blue or green, you've got a chemical change. Now, if you have one thing that's blue and the other that's clear and you mix together and it's a lighter blue, that's not a chemical change. If you have one thing that's blue and one thing that's yellow and it mixes together, I think you get green when you mix yellow and blue together. No, that's not. If you have yellow and blue and it turns red or some weird color, yes, that's a color change and that's a chemical reaction. So what you're gonna be doing is mixing a number of things together and checking, is there a chemical change or a physical change? Now remember, a physical change is when you change from one state of matter to another. Remember, the states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. An example, if you have a piece of ice and it melts, 
that's a physical change. If you have water and you boil it, that goes from a liquid to gas, but that gas is still H2O water, that's a physical change. Now, when you dissolve two things together and there's no real temperature change or color or any of these others, that's a physical, not a chemical change. If I were to take salt and put it in water, salt, sodium chloride, mixed together, oh, the salt disappeared. Well, yeah, it dissolved. Now, we'll talk more about that when we get into solutions. But if I were to remove the water from that mixture, you'd still see crystals of salt. It's a physical change. So let's look at today's lab, one of them. Because actually, you're going to do two labs today. Now, here's the various materials. Use the test tube rack. Here's the test tube. And you'll be using a tea candle. When you light the tea candle, make sure that you have nothing flammable nearby. You'll need some things from your own. You'll need some sugar, some table salt, an ice cube, matches, now I say sandpaper, that's to clean off the nail if there's any rust on the outside. Now here they say, use bottle or purified water. You can use tap water. And here are the various things. I've shown you how to use a wave boat. I've shown you how to use a balance. Remember, when you're weighing something, tear it first. Tear means zero. And here you'll need the yellow number five and blue number one coloring. Uh, be careful, that will stain skin. Ooh, do I have time? I do. Speaking about food coloring, and do not try this. Back when I was in grad school, uh, this one postdoc who worked for us who taught me about um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. He didn't phrase it that way, but it, he taught me that lesson. Uh, he had a one year Halloween party at his house. And I went and I think I went as a samurai. Hmm. But anyways, this one couple came and they were beautiful. They came as Martians and their skin and hands were green. They had a little antenna with flashing lights. And I think they wore togas to strange Martians. And my friend, I haven't beat her. How about you get your skin green? And they said, we use food coloring. Oh, no. It took about eight to 10 weeks before the green wore off their skin. It doesn't wash, wash off. So when you use food coloring, be careful unless you want it for a couple of months on your skin. Wear gloves. I can still remember them. That was decades ago. <laughs> It was so funny. They looked really good. Very nice people. So was Dr. Flavin and his wife. All right. And here's some of the other chemicals. Now, be careful with the hydrochloric acid solution and the sodium hydroxide solution. When you use the magnesium ribbon, all you have to do is cut a little piece off that with a pair of scissors. Now, today's lab, now I say magnesium is flammable, yes. Keep it away from a flame. Uh, the phenolphthalein, I think it's an ethanol, I'm not sure. Uh, these chemicals can be irritants, so make sure you have your gloves on. Uh, and they have other things. You should not ingest any of the chemicals at all and don't inhale the hydrochloric acid. Just be careful with it. Now, while you're doing a lab with chemicals, which you are, you should never be eating, drinking, or chewing gum. And before and after, wash your equipment, wash your hands, and keep it away. I never thought of this, but this is a good thing. Keep it away from children and pets. All right. 
Now they show you how to measure liquids. We've done that already. Uh, when you're using the equipment over again, make sure you rinse it a couple of times with water. Now they say here, take your big beaker and use that as your waste container, rinse it. And any liquids at the end of the lab, you can just dump down your sink and then let the water run afterward, cold water, for about three minutes or so, and you'll be safe. Now, any solids go in your uh, garbage can. Now, what you're gonna be doing today are mixing different things together, measuring the temperature and observing, do you have a chemical reaction? You'll measure the temperature before and after with your thermometer, Remember, place your thermometer on a paper towel when not using it. You do have the little plastic under, so it won't roll off, but still put it on a paper towel. Also, you don't have to shake it down. Just put it in there, let it wait about a minute to measure the temperature. Now, where they have measure it, like an activity one, use your 10 milliliter and do 10, two milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid. For this lab, anything you measure out in volume has to be a only has to be approximate. Don't spend 10 minutes trying to get exactly 2.00 milliliters. You don't have to. If you're a little over, a little under, that's okay. Now, one test tube, you put the one M means molar, and I'll teach you about that later in the semester. hydrochloric acid. In the other one, put about the same volume of the sodium bicarbonate. This is going to be cool. And then measure to record the color of each test tube before the temperature. Then you'll mix. You'll do the same thing with the sodium carbonate. Put two milliliters in a test tube, measure the temperature, clean off the thermometer with water, rinse it a little before you put it in the other test tube, mix them together. Now, I don't have it handy, so I'm gonna ask to have you use your imagination. Pretend this is a small test tube. Hold it firmly in one hand to mix it, and then take the other firmly, go one, two, three, four, five, and that will mix it. Now, don't tickle it, that won't mix it. You got to go one, two, three, four, five, and that will mix it. Now, you got to hold it firmly. Otherwise, it goes flying out of your hand. But never, ever mix a test tube like this. Never. Because you'll get chemicals on yourself. Always hold it firmly. Go one, two, three, four, five. You'll mix it. Don't tickle it. That won't mix it. and then you'll observe it. Now in activity two, you'll do the similar thing, but with, this is interesting stuff, sodium polyacrylate, also known as SAP, which is superabsorbent polymer. Now I'm gonna give it away a little, but this is the material, sodium polyacrylate, that's found in superabsorbent diapers, and also super absorbent feminine hygiene products that you women use during their period. And this is a massive industry. Uh, I forgot how over a billion dollars industry making this material. Yes. And what you'll do is weigh out about three grams, 0.3 grams, and and we test to add about 10 milliliters of water. Put the S sodium polyacrylate in there, swirl it, and watch what happens, and put the temperature. And this one, you don't dump into your beaker. You'll dispose from in the product, which will be, I'm not going to give it away, into your um, garbage can. Now, in three, you'll do the copper to sulfate with the sodium carbonate mix after you get the temperature, color, et cetera. And all these are similar. 
except let's look at number four. Number four, you're going to take your little tea candle. By the way, I have a really good collection of hand-dipped candles from Gouda, Gouda in the Netherlands. Uh, I worked in Gouda, Gouda in the Netherlands. And in the town center, they had this beautiful small little shop that made hand dip candles. They're the big pillars about this high, this diameter. I have a collection. I also have some round ones. Hold on one second. Time out for, I got to go downstairs for a show and tell. Thanks for waiting. I'm back. Is this a beautiful candle? And you can see maybe, I don't know if you can see the different layers where it was hand dipped. You really can't. But on rare occasions, I'll burn it. And this is a beautiful candle. And I have a bunch of these. Now, what you'll do for this lab and this part is on a flat surface away from anything flammable, Record the color of the tea candle, light it, watch it for a minute, and then blow it out. And is that a chemical or physical change? And if you make light, I guess they do. It's a chemical change. If you make heat, blame, chemical change. What's causing that? Something with the wax. And the company I worked for actually got to start taking certain chemicals from, uh, I'll give it away, uh, animal fat, converting it into chemicals that can be used to make candles, which they did. I think starting about the late 1700s. Uh, one other quick thing, when I used to go to Gouda and work there, Gouda, let's see if I can find something. All right, everybody see here this Right here, where it says the crazy tourist, this right here, that's the town hall. I don't have it handy, but I have a picture of me standing in front of those doors. This town hall was already old before Columbus set sail. Yes, it's that old. And I used to walk through this town center on the way to work, where I work. And... I'd walk down, not this one, but another one where they have canals in the middle. It was a beautiful way to start your day walking from the train station to our work. It was about a 10, 15 minute walk. And you go by a couple of windmills, they don't show it here. And it was a fun way to start your morning. I enjoyed it. All right, 
So you'll burn it and then now they have here place an uh, ice cube uh, in the aluminum tray you have and then hold it over there and see what happens. If you don't want to do that, just put an ice cube in a glass, come back a half hour later and what happened? I think you already know. All right, and continuing on, you'll be mixing different things together and recording your observation, all these different uh, mixtures. And again, where it says two milliliters, get close. One thing I should mention, you've already done it, but it's good to review. Here's your graduated cylinder. Remember, the volume is the bottom of the meniscus. I'll blow it up. This is where you read it, not here. So it's like a U in your graduated cylinder. And at the bottom of the U, that's where you do it. So you'll do all these different activities and in your table here, which is also in your lab report, you'll write initial color, final color, initial temperature, final temperature, observation, type of change. And that you have two choices, chemical change, physical change, explanation. Did you see bubbles, gas? Did you see a color change? Did you see a change in temperature? Did it get hot or cold? And if we go back, did you see a precipitate? Did a solid form? And if any of those, that's what you should put for an explanation. If none of those happen, and you just see saw a change in state, that would be a physical change. Now, today's lab write-up is pretty simple. You fill in the chart for this lab, your observation, and your explanation, like I just said, did you see bubbles? Did you see a precipitate? And so on. And let me remind you again, after you're done, wash your hands. Also be careful, do everything in aluminum foil pan, because if you have a marble top, I don't know if it's sodium hydroxide, some of the chemicals may damage the top of the marble in your kitchen. And you don't want that to happen. Now, I don't have marble tops in my kitchen, but I would still use a metal aluminum foil pan or do it in a sink. All right, now, today's labs, there are actually two of them. And let's look at D2L. If you go to the assignment area, you'll see lab number five, exploring physical change. And there's a slab number six I want you to do today. And it's due this Saturday. If you're late, I won't take any points off. The reason I like to get it this Saturday is this way I can grade it. You get your grade back. When we come back after spring vacation, I can go through this. Because on test number two, which is, I think, two weeks from tomorrow, Wednesday, it will have at least three balanced chemical equation problems, three points each. And this lab gives you good practice. Now, let's look at this lab. 
you'll also have to do lab number six. It's not what I wanted. All right, so everybody see balancing chemical equation. I modified the lab somewhat. Now, what you're to do is balance these equations. And a couple of these, unlike on my test, I ask you to balance an equation. You'll have to balance it because it won't be balanced. A couple of these may already be balanced. Now, Right here, there's a question that most students forget. What is the sum of the coefficients of the balance equation, problem 1i? And remember, if there's no number in front when you balance it, it's really number one. Now, let's talk about balanced chemical equations. Go back, and I would like to remind you a couple of things. One. How do you balance it? You make sure you have the same number, same type of atoms on both sides of the arrow of the equation. Well, if I have two oxygen here, you can't put it to there. That's a different molecule. It's called hydrogen peroxide, but you can change the coefficient. Now I have two oxygen, but two times two for hydrogen, how do I get four hydrogen? Can't change this, but you can change the coefficient. Two times two, four hydrogen. And now four hydrogen, four hydrogen, two oxygen, two oxygen. Now, something I might have neglected to talk about when we did it in the lecture, but I'll do it right now. Let's look at this equation. Is it balanced? Well, we've got 12 hydrogen, 12 hydrogen. We have six oxygen and six oxygen. And at first glance, you'd say it's balanced. And I would say wrong. Why? Part of the procedure for balancing an equation. If you can divide all the coefficients by the same number and get a whole number, in other words, they're multiples of the same number, then you should divide it. When you have a balanced chemical equation, you cannot divide all the coefficients by the same number and get whole numbers. And if I divide each one of these by three, I'll get this. And you want, if you look at this reaction, I can't divide all the coefficients by the same number other than one, which doesn't count, to get that. So if you have a multiple of the base equation, that's wrong, and you get zero points, because I'll mark it wrong. So remember, if you can look at all the coefficients, six, three, and three, and divide it by a number, each one, and get a whole number, which would be three, three goes into six two times, three goes into three one times, three goes into six two times, then whatever that is that you could divide it, when you can't divide it again, is the correct answer. Now, the next thing I'd like to talk about is my advice to you.
And here we have propane, C3H8. I have three carbons here. Always leave hydrogen, oxygen last. Always leave hydrogen, oxygen last. So how do I get three carbons on this side? I put a three there, the coefficient. Now, I only have hydrogen, oxygen last. I have eight hydrogen. Oh, I only have two. How do I get that to eight? Put a four there. Four times two, eight hydrogen. I have two oxygen here, but how many oxygen total do I have on this side? From CO2, I have three times two, six oxygen. From water, four times one, four oxygen. Therefore, on this side, I have 10 oxygen. How do I get 10 oxygen on this side? Five times two. 10 oxygen. Remember, on each side, you add the number of the same type of atoms in all the molecules, which is what I did here. And now if I look, three carbons, three carbons, eight hydrogen, eight hydrogen, ooh, 10 oxygen, 10 oxygen, we're balanced. All right, the last thing I like to talk about is even odd balancing equation. By the way, this is ferric oxide. You know it as rust which you don't want on your car. All right, now, why do I call this even odd? Because if we look at the oxygen on this side, we have two oxygen. On this side, I have three. That's even odd. There's no way I can multiply three by a whole number and get two. There's no way I can multiply two times a whole number and get three. So what do you do? Well, the trick, and I call it a trick or a procedure is, what number do both of these go into evenly? Well, the simplest way to find out, multiply this times this. Two times three is six. So if I want six oxygen here, I'll put a three there. If I want six oxygen here, I'll put a two there. Now I know two times two, there's four iron. I only have one. How do I get four? And I have four iron. And those are the three things. Again, one of the most important tips I can give you Leave hydrogen and oxygen last when you're balancing a chemical equation. You don't have to, but if you do, it makes your life a whole, a whole lot easier. And if you notice, I have two pages here. They're both called problem set one or problem one, but do them, balance them, and please get them to me by this Friday or Saturday or even Sunday so I can over break, uh, grade it and get your scores back. When we come back, we'll go through this on the lab day Tuesday of the Tuesday when we come back.
And let me remind you again, hopefully, let me make sure you're seeing it. Today's lab, you're doing two labs, lab number five, which is due the Tuesday when we come back from spring break. So you'll have two whole weeks to do that. And remember, for this lab, you need to do one selfie with some chemicals from that part. For the balanced chemical equations, you don't need a selfie. You want to take one out with your sheet, you don't have to. No, you don't. All right. Let me close some things. Let me get one more thing open. All right. First of all, any questions about anything with the lab or anything like that? All right. Let's get back to what we were talking about yesterday. One of the most important concepts, and that is the coefficients in an equation, chemical equation, give fixed molar ratios between the reactants and the products in a chemical reaction. You've got to know this. I won't give it to you important information. You should know this. The coefficients in a chemical equation give fixed molar ratios between the reactants and products in a chemical reaction. I didn't have it on screen. Let's do that again. Now you should see it. Again, you should know this. The coefficients in a chemical equation give the fixed molar ratios between reactants and products in a chemical reaction. And what does that mean? Here we have a balanced chemical equation. And this really means two moles of hydrogen when there's no coefficient, that's the number one. Coefficient is the number in front of the chemical formula in a balanced chemical equation. And this tells me there's one mole of oxygen and when two moles of hydrogen react with one mole of oxygen, we make two moles of water. And those ratios 
are important. They're beyond important to someone like me. All right, let's take a look at this. And I don't have points because it's going to be part of a big point problem, but you have to know how to do this. So and it says, how many moles of water are made, or I could have said are produced, when you react 8.351 times 10 to the third moles of oxygen with an excess of hydrogen? When you see one of them as an excess, you ignore it. So I don't have to worry about the hydrogen. But what are we trying to find? Moles of water. What are we given? This. And now what do we do? Well, this is the only thing we have to work with. I had a ratio, what do I want my answer to be? Well, we figured that out. And now it's time to use, you know it's coming. Your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. And whatever we're trying to get to goes on top of this ratio. Whatever we're trying to get rid of goes underneath. I'll write it in. And where do I get these numbers? From the balanced chemical equation, which you will be given. And I know for every two moles of water, I need one mole of oxygen. These numbers come from the coefficients. When there's no number, it's the number one. And these are exact numbers. And now if I look, I say moles of oxygen divided by moles of oxygen cancel out. Does anything divided by itself equals the number one? Pick up my calculator. 8.351. Blue double E, three times two. And my calculator gives me this number. And when you do a calculation, multiplication, division, you get the same number significant figures in your answer is the number you multiply and divide that has the fewest significant figures. This has four significant figures. This is an exact number. This is an exact number. Coefficients are exact numbers. Therefore, the lowest number is this, the only one. Therefore, I round this off to four significant figures. Keep the one, keep the six, keep the seven, keep the zero. Use the two to round off, that's four or less. And my correct answer is 1.670 times 10 to the fourth moles 
of water. And we're going to go a couple little bit longer and we'll then do our break, about two minutes more. Let's go through this again. I determine what are we being asked to find? Moles of water. I'm given this number. When you see excess of a chemical, you ignore it. I like my ignore it symbol. <laughs> yeah, I ignore it. And this is the only number we have to start with. We want to get to these units because we figured that out right here. And then I use unit analysis. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever units I'm trying to get rid of go underneath. Where do I get the numbers? From the balanced chemical equation. The relationship on this ratio, moles of water to moles of oxygen, you get from one mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. One mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. And you see one mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. These are exact numbers. Notice my units cancel out. And I round it off, and that's the number I get. And again, it's critical you remember the coefficients, the number in front of a balanced chemical equation gives you molar relationships. If I look at the clock, we went a little over. Let's take a break right now. I can get up and stretch, and I'll see you in about five minutes, five minutes, 30 seconds. I'll be back.
I'm back. All right, let's do one more of those, but I'm gonna let you try it on your own. All right, let's look at this. How many moles of hydrogen H2 must you react with an excess of nitrogen gas N2 to make 4.56 moles of NH3, ammonia? So what I like you to do right here first is we're going to do this stepwise. Find out. What are you being asked to find? What are you given? Right here, first we're going to do stepwise. What are you being asked to find? What are you given? Your turn. And when you're done, please vote yes. Again, all I'm asking you to do is right here or in your mind, figure out what are you being asked to find and what are you given? And when you're done, please vote yes. And please be patient. I give everybody time to finish. Finish. <laughs> All right, let's do this. What are we trying to do? We're trying to find out what? how many moles hydrogen. So we're trying to find moles hydrogen. Now we're reacting it with an excess of nitrogen. When you see excess, that means, eh, I can forget about that. But we're trying to make, remember when you go to a product, you're producing or making something. 4.56 moles of ammonia, NH3. So the only number we have to start with is this. Now, if I had some magic ratio, what would my units of my answer be? Your turn.
And the answer is right here. We're trying to do moles of hydrogen needed to make moles of ammonia. Now, what units go on top and bottom of the ratio? Use your good friend, your good buddy. And when you're done, don't forget the boat. All right, let's do this. It's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. I love that whistle. And how do you do that? Whatever units you're trying to get to go on top of the ratio, whatever units you're trying to get rid of go underneath. And I'll write them in. If I can write clearly, let's try this again. That's better. So where do I get a relationship between moles of hydrogen and moles of ammonia? I'll let you try that. I'll give you 30 seconds. Go. Hint. And you have to be given the balanced chemical equation, which you will to do this problem. You're trying to figure out what numbers go in the relationship, moles of hydrogen, moles of ammonia. Time's up. You got this relationship from the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation. Remember, this balanced chemical equation really means three moles of hydrogen when there's no coefficient. It's the number one react with one mole of nitrogen to make two moles of ammonia. The coefficients, the number in front, give you molar relationships. The three in front of the hydrogen means three moles. The one you assume when you don't see a number in front of the nitrogen is one mole. And the two in front of the NH3 ammonia means two moles. So I know for every three moles of hydrogen, I make two moles of ammonia. And that's where I get these numbers. And now, before I pick up my calculator, notice moles of ammonia divided by moles of ammonia. A divided by A equals one. Cancel out. These cancel out. What am I left with? Moles of hydrogen. That's what I want. So now I can pick up my calculator. Clear it, 4.56 times three divided by two. And the number I get is unusual, 10 to the zero, which can also be written as 6.84 because 10 to the zero is the number one. And notice, on test two, it will say under your name, please give proper 
please uh, yeah, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. This is three significant figures. All non-zero numbers are significant. Coefficients, the numbers I use to get these numbers are exact numbers and do not play a role in the final answer significant figures. So the only number we have to go is three and this is three, so we're done. We don't have to round it off. And that's how we do this. Now, let's look at real life. Ooh, real life. Don't forget, Dr. White, me, I've worked in the chemical industry. And guess what? Even in academics, you can't go into the lab and say, oh, I'm going to weigh out three moles. No, your way you weigh things is by a scale. And scale gives you weight if it's in grams, grams. And let's look at the following. And here we have a problem. You will be given the chemical balance, chemical reaction. 10 points. Yep, 10 points, 10 big ones. And the question is, how many grams of water are made when you react 85.1 grams of oxygen with an excess of hydrogen? Well, what are we trying to find? How many grams of water? What are we given? 85.1 grams of oxygen. And we react it with an excess of hydrogen. When you see excess, you got, eh, I don't have to worry about that. Consider that. So what do we do? Well, this is the only number I have to work with. Can I, in one step, use a ratio to get to my answer? Grams of water. And if I could, I'd use unit analysis, your good buddy, your good friend. I won't use this again today. I don't want you to be whistle overdosed. But anyways, this would go on top, and these units would go on bottom. And I look at this and say, where do I get a relationship between grams of oxygen and grams of water? And the answer is, there's no relationship. Can't do that. This does not exist. So what do I do? Well, I can't do it this way. What you have to do is you need to do this. in three steps. In the past, you'd have to memorize these steps to do this problem. Good news. If you look at important information, test number two mass calculations 
for reactions, which is what we're doing. We're trying to get weights, mass. So step one, you convert the mass of whatever you're given A to moles of A. We know how to do that. We just did that a couple of days ago. Step two, you convert moles of A, which you can figure it out in one, to moles of B, what you're trying to get to. And finally, in step three, you have just calculated in two moles of B, you now convert that to mass of B, which we've already done. So each of these steps we've done, but now we have to pull them all together to do this type of problem. So let's get to work. And now you'll see why this is 10 points. So what's A? Whatever we're given, that's oxygen. So we want to go from 85.1 grams of oxygen to moles of oxygen. How do we do that? Use your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis, whatever we're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever we're trying to get rid of goes underneath. And this I can do. Now here, where do we get the relationship of moles of a compound to grams of a compound? Important information, test number two. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. And the molecular weight of the compound is the sum of all atomic weights in that compound, which we've already practiced. So right here, I need the molecular weight of oxygen, because one mole equals the molecular weight, which I put in were grams of oxygen. Well. The molecular weight of oxygen is the sum of all atomic weights. There are two oxygen molecules, two times the atomic weight of oxygen. How do we do that? We go to our friendly neighborhood periodic table, look at the atomic weight, the number underneath the chemical symbol in this periodic table, 15.999. Now, remember, on test two, it will say under your name, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And it will say, please use three significant figures for all atomic weights. And I will. So 15.999 rounded off to three significant figures, 16.0. We've already done this. Now here, 2 times 16.0, 32.0. So here I put in 32.0 grams of oxygen divided by grams of oxygen cancel out. I'm left with moles of oxygen, which is what I want. Now I can pick up my calculator. 85.1 divided by 32.0, and I get a number 2.6593 times 10 to the zero, 
This is three significant figures. This is three significant figures. This is an exact number. So I should round this off to three significant figures. Keep the two, keep the six, keep the five. Use the nine to round off. That's 2.66 moles. 10 to the zero is one. So one times whatever is that number, moles of oxygen. Am I done? No, I'm trying to get to grams of water, but I'm doing the three-step procedure. We've done step one, grams, or I have it there, mass of A. I might change that to grams on my important information. Now I have to do step two. Whatever I just calculated the moles of in step one, I have to convert to the moles of what I'm trying to be. And again, you'll be given this. So now we'll do step two. Now, where do we get moles of B? What well, we just calculated in step one. So I have 2.66 moles of oxygen. What's this moles of B? It's whatever we're trying to get to. Eventually we'll get the grams, but in this case, B is what we're trying to get to water. So moles of B, what are we trying to get to chemically wise? water, we're trying to get two moles of water. And now we'll use you in analysis, your good buddy, your good friend, whatever we're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio, whatever we're trying to get rid of goes underneath. So I'll have on top moles of water, Underneath, I'll have moles of oxygen. And where do I get these numbers? From the balanced chemical equation. We want to have a relationship. Remember, when there's no coefficient, it's one. One mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. So from the balanced chemical equation, I know for every one mole of oxygen, I make two moles of water. So for every one mole of oxygen, I make two moles of water. Again, these numbers come from your balanced chemical equation. One mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. And now notice moles of oxygen divided by moles of oxygen Anything divided by itself equals number one. Cancel out. They cancel out. I'm left with moles of water, which I'm trying to do in step two. So now I can pick up my calculator. And I round it off from the previous step, 2.66 times two divided by one equals 5.32 moles of water. This is three significant figures. This is an exact number. This is an exact number. So my answer should be three significant figures, and it is. Now, one of the things I'll mention now, and I'll mention again later, there's two philosophies in rounding off or how many significant figures you get an answer when you're doing a couple of steps like we are. One philosophy is you round off at each step, which I use. The other one is you wait until the very end. On my test, I will calculate both numbers. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. If they're different and you're round off at the last step person, I'll count either way. Some of the problems when they're different can have two different answers. 
They're similar, but they're still different. All right, are we done? No, we have moles of water. We need grams of water. So what do we do? In case you forgot, go to important information, and now we'll do step three. Convert moles of B, which in our case is water, to grams of B. I think what I'll do is I'll be changing this to grams. So you can see that or put a bracket after mass. So now we have to do step number three. And we want to go from moles of B to grams of B. What is B? Water, because we just calculated that in step two. So what do I have? 5.32 moles of water. And I want to get to Grams of B will be here in this problem is water. And how do I do that? I use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, and we've done this type of problem already. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. I'll write those units in. And where do I get a relationship of grams of water to moles of water? Grams of a compound to moles of a compound? Well, in case you forgot, important information, test two. You don't have to memorize it like years ago when I taught this course. 1105 students would have to memorize everything on this page, but I'm giving it to you. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams, and the molecular weight of that compound equals the sum of all atomic weights in that compound. Well, we need water, hydrogen, oxygen. Where do we get the atomic weights? Hydrogen, 1.008. On test number two, it will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. Therefore, you have to round off 1.008 to 1.01, which is three significant figures. Oxygen, which we just did a little while ago, 15.999, becomes 16.0 to three significant figures. Well, we need the molecular weight because one mole of oxygen or water is the molecular weight in grams of water. So the molecular weight of water is the sum of all atomic weights, two hydrogen, one oxygen, two times the atomic weight of hydrogen, 1.01, .01, one times the atomic weight of oxygen to three significant figures, 16.0. This is 2.02, 16.0. Add them up, you get 18.02. Now, when you're adding, you get the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the number that has the fewest significant figures to the right of the decimal. This has two. This has one. Hopefully, you all agree one is the lowest. So, how do I round this off to one to the right of the decimal? Keep the zero. That's my one. Use the two to round off. And the molecular weight of oxygen using significant figures 18.0. So, one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of the compound in grams for this water. 
18.0. Moles of water divided by moles of water cancel out because anything divided by itself equals the number one, meaning it's canceled out. I'm left with grams of water. Now I can pick up my calculator. Five point three two times eighteen point zero. My calculator gives me this number. Let me make some room here. But as you've heard me say numerous times on test two, it'll say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. This has three significant figures. This has three significant figures. The one is an exact number. And when you multiply and divide, you get the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number that had the fewest significant figures that you're multiplying and dividing by. In this case, it's both three. So we have to round this off to three significant figures. And hit the pause button if you're watching the video and you can try it. Now you can turn it back on. Keep the nine, keep the five, keep the seven. Those are my three significant figures. Use the six to round off. Is that four or higher? Uh-uh. Is it five or higher? Yes. Drop that. Increase that by one. Oops, wrong color. Whenever I use the back instead of the eraser, the smooths on me. <laughs> I don't know why. 9.5 increase to 7, 8 times 10 to the 1 grams. And that's our answer. Now, let's take a look at what we did again. Because this is a complex problem. One of the more difficult, relaxed practice, you can do it. You'll do all semester. 10 points. How many grams of water are made when you react 85.1 grams of oxygen with an excess of hydrogen. There's the work too. So when you read the problem, you figure out how many grams of water or what you're trying to find. You're given grams of oxygen. You're also given a balanced chemical equation. There's no way you can go or I can go directly in one step from grams of oxygen to grams of water. You can't do it. See, it even says it on your screen. It must be true. Oh, that was bad humor. You can't, can't do it. You need three steps for this problem. And where do you find those three steps? Important information, test number two. First step, convert the mass or grams or whatever you're given to moles of that compound. Second step, whatever you just calculated moles of, you convert to moles of this chemical you're trying to get grams of. Final step, whatever you just calculated, moles of B, you convert it to grams of B. So first step, A is oxygen, because that's what we're given, 85.1 grams of oxygen. You convert it to moles of oxygen using your good friend, your good buddy, unit analysis. Remember, one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound, MW, and the molecular weight is the sum of all atomic weights. 
do the math, we now have moles of oxygen. We now go from step one to step two. Again, it's given to you, moles of A, oxygen. We have to go to moles of B. What molecule are we trying to get to? Water. So step two, we want to go from moles of oxygen, which we just calculated in step one, to moles of water. Use unit analysis to fill in the ratio. What you're trying to get to goes on top. What you're trying to get rid of goes underneath. Where do we get these numbers? From the balanced chemical equation. The coefficients are molar relationships. And in this reaction, one mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. One mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. And so I put in two moles of water are made from one mole of oxygen. One mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. Moles of oxygen divided by moles of oxygen cancel out. These are exact numbers. Here's the number I get. 5.32 moles of water. Are we done? No. This is where it helps writing this down. We're trying to get grams of water. And now we need to do step three. In case you forgot, step three is convert moles of a compound you just did in step 2b to grams of that compound mass. And here we have the moles of water we calculated in step two. We want to get the grams of water. Use the analysis, what we're trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. What we're trying to get rid of unit-wise goes underneath. Remember, where do we get a relationship of moles of a compound to grams of a compound? Well, in case you forgot, one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams, and the molecular weight is the sum of all atomic weights. And therefore, the molecular weight of water, two hydrogen, one oxygen, 18.0, one mole of oxygen, 18.0 grams of oxygen, water. One mole of water is equal to 18.0 grams of water. Do the math. And the final answer to three significant figures is 9.58 times 10 to the first grams of water. Now, if you round off at the end, you'll have a different number, maybe. Sometimes they're the same. Either one I'll consider correct. Now, listen carefully. This is 10 points. Show your work. I've had students mess up step two, but they did one and three right. And I give partial credit, like how bad it is or good it is. You may get, instead of 10, maybe seven or eight points, depending on your mistake or you made a math error, one point off. If you show nothing and put a number and it's wrong, you get zero points. Show your work. All right, let's do one more.
All right, let's take a look at this. How many grams, that's what G is, hydrogen gas, H2, are needed to react with an excess of nitrogen gas, N2, to make 3.111 times 10 to the fifth grams of ammonia. So, I'll give you 45 seconds to figure out what are we being tr trying to find and what are we given? All right, what are we being asked to find? How many grams hydrogen? What are we given? 3.111 times 10 to the fifth grams of ammonia, NH3. And you don't have to rewrite it, but you'll be given the balanced chemical equation. Also hint, 10 points. All right, so is there any way you can go from weight of one compound to weight of another in one step? Ooh, I forgot to two here, bad Dr. White. And the answer is no. How do you do this? You need three steps. And where do you find those three steps? important information, test number two. The first step, mass of grams or whatever we're given, we have to count, convert to moles of that compound. So let's do that. And we have 3.111 times 10 to the fifth grams of ammonia. We have a ratio what units we want to do. Oh, I forgot to hold on. Forgot to do this. Whatever we're given, in this case, 3.111, times 10 to the fifth grams of ammonia, I want to convert to moles of A, which in this case is ammonia. And now I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio, whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers? Where do I find a relationship of moles of a compound to grams of a compound? Well, in case you forgot, test number two, important information. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams, and the molecular weight of that compound is the sum of all atomic weights. So now I need the atomic weight of hydrogen. Remember on test two, we'll say, please use three significant figures for all atomic weights. Hydrogen to three significant figures, 1.01. .01. Now nitrogen right here, 14.007. You have to round that off to three significant figures. Keep the four, keep the one, keep the first zero. Use the second zero to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And eh, hopefully you pick four or less. I've dropped that in the seven to three significant figures. Nitrogen 
is 14.0. So I know for every one mole of ammonia, NH3, is the molecular weight in grams of ammonia. Well, guess what? You have to calculate that out. And there's three hydrogens and one nitrogen. Each hydrogen has atomic weight 1.01. .01. Each nitrogen, only one, 14.0. Do the multiplication. Add them up, and you get 17.03. Now, in addition, you get the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the numbers you're adding up that have the fewest significant figures to the right of the decimal. This has two to the right of the decimal. This has one. You round off the answer you get as the same number of significant figures as the in your answer to the right of the decimal as the number that has the fewest you're adding up. In this case, one. Keep the zero. Use the three to round off. So this would be 17.0. Grams of ammonia divided grams of ammonia because anything divided by itself equals number one. Cancel out. I can pick up my calculator. And that's 3.111. Blue double E five divided by 17.0. Oh, that's interesting. I'm putting these numbers in on the fly. This is what my calculator gives me. This is four significant figures. This is an exact number. This is three significant figures. So my answer should be the same. Your answer should be the same number of significant figures as the number that has the fewest significant figures. We have four, three, exact number we ignore. And notice we have three significant figures already. That never happens, but it did now. And we're done with step one. Are we done with the problem? No, because we're trying to get the grams of hydrogen. Now we need to do step number two. And what is that? Moles of A, you convert to moles of B. And again, if you forget this, you can look at important information. What's A? Whatever we started with. In this case, 1.3 times 10 to the fourth moles of ammonia. What's B, which we're trying to get moles of? Well, you look up at here and we see we want to get grams of hydrogen and that molecule is hydrogen. So we want to get the grams of moles of hydrogen. And once again, use your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top of the ratio. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. Did I tell you I'm trying to get the win the Guinness Book of World Record for saying your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis the most times in a semester? I am. Are you keeping count? Because I'm not. <laughs> All right, so what we're trying to get to is moles of hydrogen. What we're trying to get rid of, moles of ammonia. And where do I get these numbers? Where do I find a relationship between moles of one compound and moles of another? 
from the Bell's chemical equation. Remember the coefficients tell you three moles of hydrogen. When there's no coefficient, it's number one, react with one mole of nitrogen to make two moles of ammonia. Again, the coefficient, the number in front, gives you molar relationships. And here, for every three moles of hydrogen, I make two moles of ammonia. For every two moles of ammonia, I need three moles of hydrogen. So for every two moles of ammonia, which we get from up here, notice the three in front of the H2 hydrogen, I do this. And now, moles of ammonia divided by moles of ammonia cancel out. I'm left with the right units, moles of hydrogen. I now take this, multiply it by three, divide by two, and my calculator now gives me this answer. But you should have the same number of significant figures in your answer as the number that has the fewest significant figures in your multiplication division. This is three significant figures. Remember that coefficients, which we use to get these numbers, are exact numbers. They don't play a role in your calculation determining significant figures. So the lowest number of significant figures in a multiplication division, this one, is three. So you now have to round this off to three significant figures. Keep the two, keep the seven, keep the four. Use the five to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And hopefully I'll pick five or higher. I'll drop that. The number in front, I'll increase by one. And the correct answer is this, moles of hydrogen. Are we done? No, let's look at the top. We're trying to get grams of hydrogen. And now we proceed from step two to step three. Moles of B, what we just calculated, we go to grams of B. And what did we just calculate? 2.75 times 10 to the fourth moles of hydrogen. And what do we want to get to? Grams of B, in this case, that's hydrogen. And how do we proceed? Whatever we're trying to get to goes on top of that ratio. Whatever we're trying to get rid of goes underneath. And now we'll write those in. And where do I get a relationship between grams of a compound and moles of a compound? In case you forgot, one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. This is in test two important information. And the molecular weight of that compound is the sum of all atomic weights. And for hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen equals the molecular weight in grams, the molecular weight, hydrogen gas, H2, is the sum of all atomic weights to hydrogen. And we've already looked up, let's look at section one, part one, uh, step one here, atomic weight of hydrogen to three significant figures, 1.01, 1 .01, 
and that's what we get. So we put this in here. And now moles of hydrogen divided by moles of hydrogen cancel out because anything divided by itself equals the number one. It's done. And now I can have, because I'll be left with grams of hydrogen, which I'm trying to calculate. And I'll take 2.75 times 10 to the fourth times 2.02. .02. My calculator gives me this interesting number. Dr. White likes the number five. I don't know why, but I do. And remember on test two, we'll say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answer. This is three significant figures. This is three significant figures. This is an exact number. We have to round this off to three significant figures. I'll give you three seconds to do that. I gave you some bonus time, some more. Keep the five, keep the five, keep the five. Those are my three significant figures. Use this to round off. Is that four or less or five or higher? And eh, five or higher, drop that, increase that by one. Oops. So to make that amount of water, we need to use or weigh out 5.56 times 10 to the fourth grams of hydrogen with an excess of water. And that's how you do this. You need to do three steps. Now, I highly recommend go back and watch this video again and watch how I did it and the previous one. because. I promised to me, Dr. White, and I've never broken a promise to myself, on test two, there will be that type of problem where you'll need to use three steps, 10 points. I promise, so you know it's going to be there. With that, if I look at the clock and think about where we are, we're a little ahead of ourselves, we're doing good. I'm going to go through another one of these tomorrow. With that, I'll remind you, one, tomorrow, I will go through problem four, chapter four, a problem four, chapter four, problem set. I will do some more of these. And I'll talk about test number two, which is coming up the week after you come back from spring break. Don't forget, there's a lab due today and in your labs. If you have any problems, come to my office hours tonight, Tuesday, 6 to 7.15. Tomorrow, Wednesday, that would be 6 to 7.15 on Zoom. You don't even have to get in your car, but you have to go home where you do Zoom, but you don't have to come to see, oh, excuse me, COD. And with that, I'll say I'm done for today, other than if you come to my office hour, gang gazun. Goodbye now. Stole that from Granny to Beverly Hillbillies. Bye.